This video and every video on this channel is made possible by your support on patreon.com slash 616 entertainment. I couldn't do this without you and your contributions keep this channel alive. You can also grab an official shirt over on prowrestlingtees.com slash 616 entertainment. I grew up loving video games. Video games of all shapes and sizes, you know? I can recall the first time I ever experienced a video game, believe it or not. It had to be 1993 or 94. My brother and I had two friends of our same age living one floor below us in our family's Alsip, Illinois apartment. These two friends of ours had an amazing contraption in their bedroom, which I would eventually come to recognize as the Nintendo Entertainment System. Sunsoft's Batman was the first game I ever played, and what a jumping off point that is, right? Over the years, my brother and I would get a Sega Genesis, a PlayStation, eventually a PlayStation 2. It was an incredible time to be a kid. If you're watching this video, there's a pretty good chance you grew up in a similar fashion, experiencing several different consoles along the way, seeing this beautiful art form grow from generation to generation. You probably had your personal favorites the same way I did. Some of my earliest memories are tied to Castlevania on the NES. The original Resident Evil from 1996 is still my favorite video game of all time, and I've spent more hours with the WWE SmackDown series than I care to detail. But there's a difference between simple, consistent enjoyment and the unbelievable feeling of experiencing something unlike anything you've ever experienced before. God of War, released exclusively on the PlayStation 2 in March of 2005, delivered just that. Never before had I put a controller down in order to process what the hell I was seeing and feeling, and I'm not just talking about an opening cutscene or a wild moment here and there. This entire adventure is one get the hell out of here and you've got to be kidding me after the next. Battling a three-headed hydra on a creaky wooden ship in the middle of an oceanic storm? You got it. Breaking a minotaur's horn off and viciously jamming it down its throat. Watching him die as blood sprays into the air as if his jugular were a garden hose. 100%. Ripping Medusa's serpentine head from her shoulders and keeping it to use as a weapon for the rest of the game? You bet your ass. The amazing part about all of this is that we're not only barely scratching the surface, but this is just the beginning of what's to come. God of War as a franchise has spawned four direct sequels across three console generations, two prequels exclusive to handhelds, comic books, action figures, novelizations, and more. And we're about to experience all of it together. Here and now, we're beginning our journey through the history of God of War. What's up Dan Dans? Thank you very much for clicking on this video. My name is Ian and over the next six months you and I are going to explore the nooks and crannies of this franchise from its PlayStation 2 origins all the way up to the here and now as we anticipate the arrival of the big finale God of War Ragnarok. Kratos is a legendary character. The Blades of Chaos and the Leviathan Axe should be inducted into the Video Game Weapons Hall of Fame, and this unforgettable, blood-soaked tale of vengeance, betrayal, and evolution is one that should be remembered and celebrated for generations to come. And that's exactly what we're going to kick off here today. Welcome to the History of God of War Part 1, The Birth of the Ghost. Jumping headlong, balls deep into the action, the violence, the puzzles, and the unexpected might seem like a fun idea, and I promise you we'll get there, but to not shine a light on the origins of Kratos and how his story came to be would be doing not only this franchise, but you, as the viewer, a great disservice. Every journey begins somewhere, and when it comes to God of War, it all began with Mickey Mania. And no, I'm not kidding. Now you might be wondering what in Sam hell the face of Disney has to do with God of War, and damn it, I'm gonna tell you. Mickey Mania, released in late 1994 for the Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, Sega CD, and more, was the debut project for the creator of God of War, David Jaffe. 
If you're a longtime gamer, that name alone is enough to put a smile on your face and to trigger a hardcore nostalgia overload. David Jaffe not only created God of War, but co-created Twisted Metal, a series that, to this day, has a rabid fan base. A fan base that includes me, so I should know. If you don't think my friends and I were blasting each other's cars sky high with that amazing soundtrack raging in the background, you're out of your ass. Don't get me started on the 2001 entry, Twisted Metal Black, which blew us away and completely reformed our views on what a video game could be. The cinematic cutscenes for each and every character's story mode were mind-blowing, and honestly, kind of scarring. To this day, nearing my 32nd birthday later this year, the most innocuous, everyday occurrences can snap me back to my buddy Tim's bedroom, crowded around the television, mortified by these stories. A preacher, possessed during an exorcism, murders an entire family, including their baby. He enters and wins the tournament in hopes to clear his name, only to have it revealed that there was no exorcism, no possession, and that his actions were all his own. He commits suicide, and the sound of his body crashing on a vehicle below sends us to the credits. There's only one path before me. A Vietnam veteran, captured, tortured, and starved in a 25-foot hole, was forced by the enemy to eat the rotting corpse of his comrade in order to stay alive. Upon winning the tournament, his ultimate wish was granted, the opportunity to consume the flesh of the man who put him in that position. Do you get the picture? We were 10, 11 years old, blazing through this game and watching these cutscenes with the volume turned down because we knew this was hardcore. We knew we would probably get questioned if our parents came into the room and saw what the hell was on the screen. This was the best. These are the memories that stick with you, and that's... I mean, that's David Jaffe's work. Now, I was 14 when God of War came out. I had no idea what was going on. I didn't come into God of War going, oh, dude, this is directed by the same guy who did Twisted Metal Black. I had no clue. But now that I'm older and I do know that, it's actually fairly obvious. There are similarities all over the place, and we'll touch on them going forward. Quick salute to the man of the hour, though. David Jaffe, you beautiful bastard. But David Jaffe wasn't alone, obviously. There was an entire team behind the creation of God of War. That team was Santa Monica Studio, responsible for such titles as Kinetica, the 2001 PlayStation 2 racer, God of War, God of War 2, God of War 3. I mean, it's Kinetica and then all God of War games. It's almost like this is their bread and butter or something, right? Santa Monica Studio, if you're unaware, is a first party developer under the PlayStation Studios banner. Some of you watching this don't need that spelled out for you, but hey, not everyone follows the industry as close as we do, alright? Be cool. Here in 2022, first party teams are invaluable. There's a reason that Sony bought Insomniac Games after the release of Spider-Man in 2018. There's a reason Microsoft paid $8 billion for Bethesda and close to $69 billion for Activision Blizzard King shortly thereafter. When you're drafting a team to compete at the highest level, you want the best of the best playing for your team and wearing your jersey. In the PlayStation 2 generation, Sony's roster of first party offerings played a huge part in what was, without question, an unparalleled era of dominance. Naughty Dog gave us the Jack and Daxter series, and would go on to deliver Uncharted and The Last of Us. Polyphony Digital's Gran Turismo 3 and Gran Turismo 4 hold the number 2 and 3 slots in the best-selling PS2 games of all time list, trailing only the juggernaut that was Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Insomniac's Ratchet & Clank series, Sucker Punch's Sly Cooper trilogy, the list goes on and on. I'm not going to run down the entire call sheet because that would be ridiculous. Why am I telling you all of this? The topic at hand is God of War. Why are we digging this deep into PlayStation 2? We're doing this because it's important. It's history. Both God of War and its lead, Kratos, are synonymous with the PlayStation 2. Kratos' status as a pillar for Sony, as a mascot for their console, as a star of their show, all began here on the PlayStation 2. 
You can't forget where you came from. And on a console also home to Metal Gear Solid 3, Snake Eater, Guitar Hero 2, all of the Dragon Ball Z Budokai games, WWE SmackDown vs. Raw, Tony Hawk's Underground, and more, you might be interested to know that God of War outsold all of the games I just mentioned. When I say that God of War is a massive piece of the PlayStation 2's legacy, I am not exaggerating. It is only at this point that I feel I have properly laid out the foundation for what is about to unfold. So are you ready to get into the game itself? The story of God of War, the action, the violence, all of it. Good. Me too. God of War begins like any other game. You know, nothing out of the ordinary. I mean, most games kick off with the suicide of the main character, right? Oh, they don't? Well, this one does. Now there is no hope. And Kratos cast himself from the highest mountain in all of Greece. But why? How could he do this? Well, you're gonna find out. Let's roll the clock back about three weeks. Kratos, the ghostly, apparitional warrior adorning the game's box art, is on a mission from the gods. We're on a mission from God. Yeah, I mean, same deal. You see, Kratos, after carrying out the orders of the gods for more than a decade, has had enough. He screams into the night sky for Athena, demanding a release from the horrible nightmares from which he suffers. You'll find out all about the nightmares in a minute. Kratos is promised forgiveness for his past by Athena. After the completion of one final task, he must take down Ares, the god of war. Why the hell would Athena want to plot the downfall of her own brother? Well, Ares has gone haywire. He's wreaking havoc on all of Athens, destroying everything in his wake, and he must be stopped before it's too late. Why doesn't she do it herself? I'm glad you asked, and the game doesn't let that hang as a loose end. It was Zeus himself who ordered that no gods shall ever go to war with each other, meaning divine intervention in this instance is strictly forbidden. So that's simple, right? Defeat Ares. Not quite. A mortal challenging a god is no easy feat. That and Kratos and Ares share a checkered, blood-soaked past. In between hardcore, drag-out brawls with colossal beasts, we'll highlight the bosses in a minute too, we're treated to cutscenes that further the story. Many years ago, Kratos was a captain in the Spartan army. His brutal reputation was known far and wide, and like many before him, his ego took priority over his family. And though Kratos was a savage leader, he was not invincible. The barbarians of the East far outnumbered Kratos in the Spartan army, and after a long and arduous battle, all hope was lost. As the barbarian leader's killing blow loomed overhead, Kratos did the unthinkable, swearing his soul to Ares, the god of war, in return for salvation from this loss. Ares would lay waste to the barbarian horde and befit his new servant with the blades of chaos, weapons forged in the depths of Hades, the chains seared into his flesh, never to be removed. And though Kratos gained victory on that night, what he would come to lose would far outweigh this triumph. Not a single soul was safe from Kratos, not civilians, not his own soldiers should they bat an eyelash at his orders, no one. One night, in a blood rage fueled by his master Ares, Kratos and his army laid waste to an entire village. It was only when the smoke cleared that the truth was revealed. This village felt familiar to Kratos for a reason. It's because this village was his own. The Blades of Chaos cut down everyone in their path, including his own wife and daughter. Shattered, completely hollowed out by the torment of his actions, Kratos pleaded to the gods, only for Ares to appear, and reveal that this was no coincidence and no accident. With Kratos' wife and child dead, he could serve Ares with his every waking breath, as there would be no distractions. As the homes and the bodies burned, a village oracle who had previously warned Kratos not to step foot into the city reappeared, cursing him for all eternity. Kratos' pale, ghostly skin is not war paint. These are the ashen remains of his wife and child, 
bonded to his flesh, an ever-present reminder on what he had done on this night. It was in this moment that Kratos knew, Ares must be destroyed. Holy shit! Hey, we're only just getting started, but recounting these details has my jaw on the floor all over again. And don't be mistaken, the game doesn't give you all of this information all at once. You have to earn this, cutscene by cutscene, as the game progresses. But with the retrospective, we get to look back. We've got the bird's eye view, you know? Maybe now you understand why Kratos so quickly accepted Athena's final task of killing a god. This is the opportunity he's longed for for the past 10 years. Freedom from the torment, freedom from the nightmares he's been suffering from. Revenge against the man who did this to him in the first place. Now you understand. So Kratos is going to take down Ares, right? That sounds simple. Wrong. Look, Kratos might be an absolute savage. He may be armed with the blades of chaos and fueled by vengeance, but he's still a mortal, challenging a god. And for Christ's sake, he can't challenge Ares until he gets to Ares, and right now, that's a long ways out. Athens is a boat trip and a hydra slaying away from here, and holy god, let's talk about the hydra fight. If this didn't blow your ass in half, you're not human. You're bullshit. Your entire existence is bullshit. The roar of this beast, to me, is about as iconic as Godzilla, as the legendary T-Rex. <laughs> Impaling these heads on broken masts set the tone for the adventure in front of us. And if this fight weren't enough, how about this? We need a key held by a man who was on this boat. A man the Hydra swallowed a few minutes earlier. So the key's inside the Hydra, right? We're screwed. Unless... I mean, unless we walk into the mouth of the fucking Hydra and go down its throat until we find the fucking guy, take the fucking key, and cast him into the depths of the slain beast. You have got to be kidding me. And not for nothing, but think about what we just saw. Let me play it back for you. <laughs> You came back for me. I didn't come back for you. No! Kratos is no hero. This isn't Superman flying in and saving a little boy and his dog from getting hit by a bus. This isn't Spider Man risking life and limb to make sure a bus full of people doesn't fly off the tracks. Kratos didn't come here to save you or anybody else. Ares must die. That's it. You? Fuck you. Get out of my face. Unbelievable. With the Hydra slain, it's on to Athens. What's in Athens? Minotaurs. What does Kratos do to Minotaurs? Words, right? Wrong. Big boy Cyclops is dropped in to stomp ass. Gotta stab him handle deep right in the eyeball. Bye bye, big boy. Medusa makes her presence felt for a second. Kratos rips her head clean off, and guess what? Her gaze, the eyes that turn enemies to stone, is now ours to keep. And that's a mechanic I've carelessly glossed over so far. Each one of the gods along the way will lend us a hand and grant Kratos new abilities. For the Hydra fight, Poseidon gives us his rage. Later on, Zeus's fury allows us to throw lightning bolts to drop distant and airborne enemies. Mixing and matching these abilities is key to certain battles. They can make or break your experience, and yes, they're all upgradable, as are the Blades of Chaos. All of these red orbs spilling out of chests and slaughtered jabronis, these are our experience points. If you want to stand a chance in hell as the game progresses, you better spend these points. I also want to take a quick second to put over the design with how we obtain new powers and abilities. I don't know about you guys, but I really detest playing a game where a character is muttering to themselves over and over, I bet I can scale that wall if I use my grapple hook. 
Oh, my bag is getting heavy. I better head back to camp. I'm not stupid. I know what I'm doing. God of War gives us a new ability. They force us to use it one time so we understand the concept. And that's it. The game will never bug you about it again. Use it or don't. That's up to you. I love it. Okay, back to business. We're in Athens. We gotta find the Oracle. She's got some sort of gimmick to aid our quest for vengeance. But who the hell is this guy? Let me just play this for you, as it is, in my opinion, one of the coolest parts of the game. Good, my boy. Good. Athena has chosen wisely. I knew it was so. Who are you? So, you have the blades, the skin as pale as the moon. You are the one indeed. Perhaps Athens will survive at that. <laughs> But be careful. Don't want you dying before I'm done with this grave. A grave? In the middle of a battle? Who will occupy it, old man? You will, my son. Oh, I've got a lot of digging to do indeed. All will be revealed in good time. And when all appears to be lost, Kratos, I will be there to help. That's, that's a bit haunting, is it not? Holy Christ. And if you feel like this is all happening at a breakneck pace, that's because it is. God of War does not dilly-dally. We are not tiptoeing through the tulips. There is no filler here. Every single second of this adventure matters. Now that, I appreciate. Hey, we found the Oracle, son of a bitch! It's a race against the clock to rescue the Oracle. After going through all this nonsense, she spills the beans. We need to secure Pandora's box in order to stand toe to toe with Ares. That's the game changer. So off we go. Have you ever traveled across a bridge made of a gigantic sword? This is what I'm talking about, man. These are the moments that force you to stop and just take it all in. Where the hell is Pandora's box anyway? It's hidden in the middle of the desert of lost souls, which is crawling with sirens and plagued with eternal sandstorms. Is that all? No. Somewhere in the desert is the titan Kronos, the last of his kind. Pandora's box is stashed away inside the temple, which is chained to Kronos' back. Yes, we're about to play an entire level on the back of a living being. When we're talking about scale in video games, the feeling of enormity and what seems like endlessness, God of War picked up the bar and set it higher than any game I'd ever played before. Shadow of the Colossus might have come to mind for you, and that's another great example, but God of War was on shelves in March of 2005, and Shadow released in October of 2005. Over the next several years, games like Resistance 2, Dead Space, Infamous 2, all of these massive enemies had me going, yep, that's some God of War shit right there. And it's not just the enemies, but the environments as well. When the camera pulls way out, we can feel the scope of these stages. It's out of control. I find it funny that it takes Kratos days to ascend the Titan Kronos and even reach the temple, only to be told at the top that no one has ever made it all the way to the box. This guy here burns the bodies of all the soldiers who have tried and failed. And that's what I find funny. Man, I didn't think anyone else would be able to get up here with everything Kratos just went through. I guess it's not that hard though. Look at all these jamokes who have tried and failed. Pandora's Temple is a multi-tiered labyrinth filled with puzzles, death traps, challengers of all shapes and sizes, the challenge of Hades, which consists of some of the most heart-pounding oh shit, oh shit, oh shit moments in all of gaming, and to top it off, a showdown with Pandora's Guardian. This boss fight is tremendous, and it all caps off with the Guardian impaled, stuck to the wall, its blood coating the floors with a sweet ruby finish. The journey continues, and once the box is in our grasp, Athena appears. We've got to bring the box back to the city and open it up. This is it. The moment we've been waiting for, right? Ares, that son of a bitch, that treacherous, slimy, bottom-feeding- Oh, fuck. I will see to that. <laughs> Goodbye, Spartan. 
You will rot in the depths of Hades for all eternity. As the life began to leave Kratos, his thoughts returned to that fateful night. Even in death, the memories, the visions would not fade. And Kratos fell into the underworld, the river Styx beckoning below, the currents strong enough to carry even the strongest mortal to his eternal resting place. Nah, nah, nah. Ares may have stapled our ass to the wall. He may have banished our soul to Hades, but that's not gonna keep Kratos down. No way, not after all this. The ghost of Sparta's rage cannot be contained, not even by Hades. You again? Oh. It's not gonna be easy. In fact, it's gonna be quite challenging, but there's nothing that can stop Kratos now. And then, a lifeline. Kratos ascends the mysterious rope and oh my god. Ah, Kratos. And not a moment too soon. I only finished digging just a moment ago. Who are you? Now that is an interesting question. But for now, you must hurry. Athens needs you. But how did you know I would- Athena isn't the only god keeping watch on you, Spartan. Complete your task, Kratos, and the gods will forgive your sins. Get out of here, dude. Let's go. There's Ares taunting the gods with Pandora's box in hand. Boy, you should have been watching your back because now it's on. What's inside Pandora's box? That's the age-old question. And now we have the answer. It's the power of the gods, which makes you big, I guess. This fight is a son of a bitch, and it's not a simple one-on-one -on -one battle. In a cruel, cruel twist of fate, Ares traps Kratos in a delusion where he's forced to protect his family from himself. Dozens of himself. And when it all looks to be finished... Kratos, please take us home! Do you see, God of War? You took them once, but you'll never have them again! You cannot save them, Kratos. You gave them up in your quest for ultimate power. There is a price to pay for everything you gain. Not that price. I didn't want them to die. No price is too high for what I offered. And you rejected me. A god! Now, you will have no power. No magic! All that is left for you is death! Oh, not... not again. You should have joined me, Kratos! You should have been stronger! By the gods. The battle was not over. The gods, it seemed, had a final gift for Kratos. I still have allies in Olympus, Ares. Now, you will see how strong I am. Again, are you kidding me? The war rages on back and forth in a fight where a health bar is shared at the very top. Every time Ares strikes, he steals his dwindled energy back, making our every move an important one. But when it's all said and done, <clears throat> Remember, Kratos, it was I who saved you in your time of greatest need. I haven't forgotten, Ares. I remember how you saved me. That night, I was trying to make you a great warrior. You succeeded. <laughs> Ares' corpse explodes in a blast befitting a fallen god, and Kratos makes his way back to Athena. With his task completed, 
His past is forgiven. But that's when Athena drops the bombshell. Kratos' nightmares, his horrible visions, will never end. Forgiveness from the gods and forgiveness for yourself are not one and the same. And as Athena states, no god or man could ever forget committing such a terrible deed. And so, we're back to the start. Now there is no hope. And Kratos cast himself from the highest mountain in all of Greece. After ten years of suffering, ten years of endless nightmares, it would finally come to an end. Death would be his escape from madness. Only, the gods had other plans. Kratos was lifted from the depths and given a new purpose. With Ares dead, there's now an empty throne. As we ascend the golden heights of Mount Olympus, we, the player, recount the journey we just conquered. Kratos, the ghost of Sparta, is now the god of war. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I could play through the original God of War a million times and never get tired of it. The story is insane, the gameplay is phenomenal, the twists and turns, get out of here. And there's so much more to talk about. Look, I promise I'm not going to keep you here all day, but this is the history of God of War Part 1 and we need to start things off with a bang. Speaking of banging, let's talk about the sex minigame where Kratos gets down to business with two ladies aboard the ship in the beginning. This has been labeled years after the launch of the game as misogynistic, which the franchise creator and game's director, David Jaffe, has fired back on multiple times. Kratos isn't taking advantage of these women. Kratos isn't forcing himself on anyone. To view consensual sex as misogynistic somehow doesn't really compute with me. Is it shitty of Kratos to try and bury his guilt in sex and alcohol? Sure, but guess what? Kratos isn't a good person. He's not a hero. We've already been through this. If you're playing a God of War game looking for a role model, you should take a long, hard look in the mirror. And when it comes to long and hard, boy oh boy, let's touch on the platforming section near the end of the Temple of Pandora. What did you think I was going to say? This sucks. Jumping across gaps, climbing across walls, all of it throughout the rest of the entire game feels great. But this portion here, in the scaffolding high above the ground, this sucks. One false move and you're dead. Is it my fault? Should I just get good? Why don't you get good, jabroni? You know what's good? These quick time events. Yeah, I said it. The quick time events are awesome. And you know who else thought they were awesome? Fucking everybody. God of War set the bar when it came to scale, and God of War changed the game when it came to quick time events. These weren't common back in 2005. Resident Evil 4 had quick time events, but they were not the norm. They'd become the norm, sure, and would eventually be driven into the ground, but not here. This was the hotness in 2005. As far back as 2004, the year before God of War launched, Santa Monica Studio would describe God of War as merging the action of Devil May Cry with the puzzle solving of Eco. But the comparisons don't stop there, as David Jaffe himself has credited Onimusha as a strong inspiration as well. What's funny is that not all inspirations come from such obvious places. This Thermosilk shampoo commercial was an early inspiration for the tone of the game's Greek setting, serving as a great example of how to make Greek mythology look badass and sleek for a modern video game. The narrator you've heard through the game's cutscenes is voiced by Academy Award winner Linda Hunt. The memories came rushing back as familiar and permanent as the blades chained to his wrists. Names like Morgan Freeman and James Earl Jones had been batted around, but it was a Lexus commercial featuring the voice of Linda Hunt that sealed the deal for David Jaffe. Chaos reigns and panic knows when something wicked this way comes. 
I'm serious about these last two as well. This comes straight from the mouth of Mr. Jaffe himself. That's also where I learned that there was a full length, full game commentary track recorded and discarded because it wouldn't fit on the disc. This recording was never released and may be considered a lost piece of God of War's legacy. But it's not like there's no behind the scenes information here. I mean, good lord. Look at this, the character graveyard. The game calls this where rejected characters go to die. But to me, I think this is where they go to live on. If the character graveyard weren't included on the disc, we would never know about any of this. If you're a nerd like I am for this sort of thing, this is heaven. Kratos was almost a dude with dreadlocks. He was almost blue. Good thing they went with red though, as blue Kratos looks exactly like the barbarian from Diablo 2. This game is overflowing with extras, man. Making of featurettes, discarded levels. Come on, so good. I don't know if I should be doing this, but I'm going to. I'm gonna spill the beans. If you beat God of War, and then you beat God of War on God mode, there's a little secret ski waiting for you. Now, now, I shouldn't, but I'm gonna tell you what it is. It's a phone number. This phone number. Go ahead, pause the video, call the number. Yes, it still works. I mentioned several of David Jaffe's previous works at the top, notably the 2001 vehicular combat classic, Twisted Metal Black. Anyone who has ever played both Twisted Metal Black and God of War might know where I'm going with this. But man, oh man, are Jaffe's fingerprints all over these stories. Who remembers Sweet Tooth's story from Twisted Metal Black? A ruthless murderer, cursed with never-ending flames burning him for all eternity. Sweet Tooth enters the Twisted Metal contest under the pretense that victory would earn him... What? freedom from the curse, freedom from his nightmares. Sound familiar? It's the same goddamn thing. At the end of Kratos' journey, he finds the nightmares will never end. At the end of Sweet Tooth's journey, he finds out the curse will never be broken if he continues killing, which, I mean, that's unreasonable. So, the curse remains. I see you, David Jaffe, I see you. What an awesome connection. When it comes to critical reception, there are no surprises. There's no moment here where I get to stun you with something you don't already know. God of War was a blockbuster hit, a massive success, both critically and commercially. With 4.6 million units sold, God of War ranks at number 14 on the highest selling PlayStation 2 games of all time list. And to put that further into context, the PS2 is still the best-selling video game console of all time. I didn't buy God of War on day one. I wasn't following it in the news. I wasn't up to date on what this game even was until the reviews went live. I was 14 years old. I checked IGN.com every day, just keeping up with the industry, reading reviews and such. I clicked on God of War review, read through it, and was really captured by the final lines. Purchase it, rent it, borrow it, whatever it. Just play the game. Those words with a big honkin' 9.8 score sold me. At the time, I don't think I had ever seen a score that high. I was like, holy shit, this must really be something. And guess what? It was. Few games, few experiences, have ever sunk their hooks into me the way God of War did. Even fewer experiences can take such high praise and still find a way to exceed all expectations. I should have known then that I was a lifer for this franchise. Hell, maybe I did know. And that's the beautiful part of all this, Dan Dans. This whole thing we've just been through, this was only the beginning. Holy jeez, guys, thank you very much for joining me for the History of God of War Part 1, The Birth of the Ghost. If you've played this game before, I implore you, go back and play it again. If you've never experienced it firsthand, you must. And it's not as hard as you might think. There's an HD collection on the PS3, and you can even get it on PS Vita, if you're a real one. You can get the Platinum Trophy twice, just like I did. 
Do not ask me for tips on how to beat the final challenge of the gods because I almost jumped off a bridge trying to do it myself. Thanks a lot, Jaffe. There's much more story to tell, and that's exactly what we're going to do on Friday, July 22nd, in the history of God of War Part 2, The Destruction of Olympus. This 2007 sequel is considered the swan song of the PlayStation 2, and oh my goodness, are you not going to want to miss this one. Until next time, Dan Dans, I love ya, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>